afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to this Meta Cafe organized by the Institute of Neurosemantics Malaysia. As uh, what Irene asked just now, why Meta Cafe? This Meta Cafe was born out of the MCO era where we would like to meet, but we couldn't meet. So we decided to have it at the Meta level. So good afternoon and uh, welcome again. I am Mazuki. I'm a neurosemantics trainer and meta coach, and I also represent Malaysia in the leadership team of the International Society of Neurosemantics. And I'll be your host for today. Don't worry, I won't be speaking on the topic. That one, I'm going to leave it to Roy, just, just mounting the pressure on him. <laughs> now, this is the Meta Cafe meeting. The purpose of these Meta Cafe meetings is to develop connections in the Institute and with the Institute. It is also a platform for us to refresh our knowledge of neurosemantics, to recharge and be inspired with new meanings. And it's also a place for us to increase our collaboration and more importantly is to have fun. These meetings are organized every month that is on the third Saturday of the month. So those of you who are not familiar yet, on the third Saturday of the month around this hour, we have our Meta Cafe. I would like to introduce the Institute of Neurosemantics Malaysia. And our purpose or objective of the Institute is one, to provide support to members. When we talk about members, these are the trainer members, the neurosemantics trainers, and also the meta coaches uh, in our midst. Not just limited to those, there are so many more uh, people who have attended some form of NLP and neurosemantics training. So this is also in support of the practitioners of neurosemantics and meta coaching. Apart from members of the Institute, the uh, INS Malaysia is also here to provide service to the community through learning and coaching events, such as the one that you are attending today. Now, before I go on to the session that we are going to have this uh, uh, today, just to make sure that you have uh, access to all of the controls that is in front of you uh, in Zoom. Uh, first thing is that I would like to check whether you have chat access. Uh, you are able to access the chat uh, box. Now, I'd like to invite you to write one word that describes how you are feeling right now. So uh, whether you are using your iPhone or your Android phone or you're using the laptop, those of you using the laptop will be much easier. So let me uh, just uh, see you put in your uh, chat box. Let me know what is the one word that describes what you are feeling right now. I see Chandrani putting in excited to learn. So you've got three uh, words there. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, uh, you put in curious, uh, Roy, and <laughs> joyful nervousness. <laughs> yeah, so it means to say, uh, I've uh, uh, done my job well to mount in the pressure on dry. Uh, Daniel is dancing uh, there and watching, multitasking. So you've got an eye on some of the work that you need to do, uh, watching. Uh, and from Irene, curious, and Sean, relax. So thank you very much, everyone. Now I know that each and every one of you, uh, and also uh, Dr. Amin, uh, relax. Now I know that each and every one of you, you have access to the uh, chat uh, feature uh, because it may come in useful later uh, when Roy begins, uh, uh, begins uh, presenting on the topic. If you want to ask questions or whatsoever, then you can put it inside the chat box. Now, the next one is I would like you to introduce yourself in a short while. Uh, I'm going to throw you into the breakout room. So this is to, to, to check whether you have access to audio as well. So when you are in the breakout room, if you don't want to uh, switch on your video, that's okay because for some people, um, 
if the internet connection is not so strong, then they would rather not put in the video. But to make sure that you have uh, audio access, in a short while, I'm going to throw you into the uh, breakout room. And in that breakout room, I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself to two other people. I'll do my best to put you into groups of three. Introduce, introduce yourself with just two things. One is to tell your friends in the room your name. And the other is the town or city that you were born. So not where you're living now, okay? It's your place of birth and also the name, uh, your name. Okay, so I'm going to put you into the breakout room, make sure that everybody has a chance to introduce themselves because you are going to be in that room for only two minutes. So there'll be three of you uh, in two minutes. Uh, you'll be in that room. So where's my breakout feature? Uh, breakout room. Oh dear, out oh there. Breakout room, just to make sure that we have uh, three Three, two, four. Yeah, three, two, four would be uh, 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 better. So in two minutes, introduce yourself by mentioning your name and the town or city that you are born. So uh, enjoy yourself in that room and I'll see you in two minutes time. So go ahead. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Guaqing. And Sean, you're back. Yes. yes. I, I'm so glad you yeah, came I'm back, Roy. <laughs> Otherwise, you <laughs> put the pressure on me. <laughs> Roy, you're on mute, Roy. No, no, no. I wanted yeah, to MIA. Know. I was thinking to MIA for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, so everyone's back uh, here. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you had fun knowing one other item about uh, uh, the friend that was in your room that uh, you may know, because sometimes we may know that that person is from Petaling Jaya or, uh, or Daman Sara or whatsoever, but you didn't know that he was born in Machang, did you? <laughs> so... Uh, again, welcome to this session. I hope that now you, uh, uh, you are able to access your mic, you can speak. So it means that during the session, in case you want to ask a question and Roy opens up the opportunity to ask questions, then you can do that. You can uh, unmute your mic and then you can ask uh, uh, verbally. 
And I hope that is also the same for Darren because I think Darren, you're driving or something. If you are driving, then keep your eyes on the road, not on the screen. <laughs> now, just a couple of things for me to mention that we'll be here for about 90 minutes or so. Uh, and I would like to invite you right now uh, to keep your videos on if it is safe for you to do that, to keep your videos on because it will be very helpful and very encouraging for Roy to be able to see uh, people's faces. Uh, even though that person is uh, eating some nuts at the moment, but it's okay. Just to be able to see people's faces will be very, very uh, encouraging to the speaker. Uh, at the same time, please keep your mics off because uh, if there might be noises in the background that might interrupt with the presentation. Now, if you have any questions and the, the question just suddenly came up to you, you can just put it into the chat room. Right, just put it in the into the chat room, and I would uh, request that you put a queue uh, in front with a colon, and then put in the question because that will in, inform me that you have a question. And when the time is uh, suitable, then I can post it to Roy. Okay, so that's about uh, it that I just want to mention. Now I would like to introduce the uh, presentation that we are going to have uh, today. Now. Today, we are going to have a presentation on the score dance. So let me check. How many of you dance with a partner? Okay, because dancing alone is different. You can just jive. TikTok, in. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok. Uh, so that's not what I'm referring to. Dancing with a partner. And when you are dancing with a partner, there is that back and forth uh, motion sideways or whatever way that you go uh, through. However, when you're dancing with a partner, there is that harmonious energy that ebbs and flow as you dance. Now picture that in a coaching conversation. And that is what we are here for today. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Roy Tan. Roy is a trainer meta coach and author he helps companies create a compassionate corporate culture through the spirit of omoyari i hope i got that uh, uh, that pronunciation right uh, roy now the spirit of omoyari that roy refers to definitely it is not the spirit type that goes silently in the night Neither it is the spirit that causes you to be intoxicated if you take too much. You know, we are not referring to that type of spirit. However, omoyari is the Japanese art of compassion. So if you want to know more about that, then you can contact Roy directly. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome Roy Tan to present on the score dance. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's uh, get my screen up. Uh, thank you very much, Mazuki, for being the host for today once again. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope uh, you are ready to go for today's session. For those of you who have not been to Meta Cafe, I welcome you if this is your first time. And we hope to see you more frequently uh, uh, um, in more future Meta Cafe sessions to come. Um, so I've shared my screen. Can you all see my screen at the moment? Can, right? Okay, great. So uh, thank you very much again, Mazuki, to test everyone's uh, ability to access the chat room, uh, which I will be getting everyone to most likely use um, um, uh, in this session. Um, and so uh, once in a while, I'm gonna, uh, I think one of the things that we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a couple of experiments later on. So maybe once I get some feedback from you, maybe you can post your feedback on that chat box. Uh, and also, I think Mazuki has also mentioned, if you have any questions, put a queue up front. Uh, and uh, Mazuki, by all means, if you find uh, that if the question is relevant to what I'm speaking about, feel free to interrupt me. Let me know. Hey, Roy, hang on before you move on. I think there's a question on, on something. Please help me just uh, monitor that chat box uh, if I'm too excited sharing what I'm sharing today. Okay. Uh, so that being said, um, uh, I'm going to start off my session in today's Meta Cafe. Uh, well, today... I think the topic is pretty interesting. We're going to talk about the dance 
Um, uh, and I think uh, TikTok is a trend right now, especially for the younger generation. Not mentioning it, I've seen uh, older people, even grandparents also doing TikTok pretty good. Uh. I think everyone's like re reconnecting to their uh, inner you know, creative side of uh, music and uh, dance. Uh, so today's session about the score dance is, um, the score dance is actually a model uh, from uh, Meta Coaching or Meta NLP. Uh, and what I'm about to share with you today is hopefully an overview of, of how we can use this framework uh, in our coaching conversations, in, in our practice of NLP. Uh, but uh, bear in mind, today's session is based on my understanding and my interpretation of uh, what Michael Hall has taught. And I'm going to try to put the pieces together and hope it makes sense to everyone in this room. Uh, so I'm going to add a bit of my experience, uh, add a bit of some of my meaning-making tensions. Uh, but I hope that you can have fun today uh, and take something out of today's session. So without further ado, I think everyone is very excited because the topic uh, that I wanted to put is called the score dance. And uh, one of the idea of I put dance is whenever I start to, uh, I like to engage with others, I, I like to create a sense of curiosity. Uh, and I think the title mentions a lot that, hey, you know what, what is the score dance about? And so what I like is people asking questions before they come to learn, right? They must ask, what, what's this dance all about? And I think from the chat box, uh, we had a couple of people that said, uh, I'm curious to know what the dance is about. And I think curiosity is what keeps us growing, keeps us uh, exploring, uh, and life is about continuous learning. And so as we come, become curious, uh, I think it helps us unleash a little bit about our, our mind and our hearts to accept differences, to accept different ideas, and to see things from different perspectives. And so the score dance is used in the context of a conversation. How many of you here would agree with me that having a conversation with someone else is just like dancing? How many of you agree? If you agree, please go to the chat room, give me a five. If you can go to the chat room, give me a five. If you, if you would agree that having a conversation is like a dance. Great. So what makes you think so? What makes you think a conversation is just like a dance? You can go to the chat room, let me know. What makes you think that having a conversation is just like a dance? Why so? Needs feedback, right? Okay. Harmonize and fun like a dance, not war. <laughs> uh, there's a dynamic energy flowing between the two. And so like a dance, you need harmony and rapport, you need mutual participation, you need to, to be comfort with each other. Right? So, so in a dance, well, you can dance alone, but a conversation is a dance with someone else. You are, you, you are not alone in that particular space, you are doing it with someone else. And if you are just talking alone, it's like talking to the wall. Right? And so let's go down to where converse, the word conversation comes from. So the word conversation derives from two Latin roots. So namely, com, right? Com means together. And versare means to turn. So if you bring these two words together, it literally means turning together. So the word conversation means turning together. Maybe perhaps in our daily life of understanding and maybe in, in a structured way of coming together as a couple. So turning together is like coming back and forth. So dancing is like, I'm going to take a couple steps, you take a couple steps, we're going to come and we're going to exchange these steps so that we create art, we create something to, together. And so in a conversation, it is a dance. So it's not a one-way traffic, it's not a two-way traffic, it's a, it's a continuous back and forth, an exchange of ideas, exchange of comments, exchange of feedback, and, and that's what the dance is all about. So today's topic is dancing. And in this short hour, I hope that I can bring you on a journey of discovery. Uh, hopefully what I can uh, share today can help you be a more effective coach, whether in your personal or professional lives. So a quick check in the room. How many of you here are coaches? Coaches. Coaches, coaches, show of hands, coaches, okay. Okay, okay. How many of you are meta coaches? Uh, like Irene, you can give me a thumbs up so if you can reaction, okay. 
Meta coaches, Meta coaches. Okay, great. <laughs> so if you are not a coach, maybe like uh, Rani and Chandrani, uh, maybe you can start exploring a coach. Uh, are you parents, Rani and Chandrani? Are you are your parents? Your parents? Yeah. Okay. So parents are also indirectly coaches. Okay. So I'm a new father. Uh, five months old baby, I haven't had enough sleep for the past couple of months. Uh, but I think uh, the coaching technique, I think Marzuki teaches this, right? Parent, parenting uh, and using coaching as a parenting skill. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting if you can use the coaching technique uh, as a parent. So uh, to start off, I want to take, I want to take you back in time. Uh, I think everyone in this room more or less have watched this movie, right? There's no one younger that don't know about this Back to the Future movie. Uh, I want you to take uh, take you back in time uh, when coaching was first introduced and so the first use of the term coach came about um, with an instructor or trainer uh, I think in about 1830 in Oxford University it's, it's sort of like a slang where a tutor is supposed to carry uh, sort of carry quote unquote a student through an exam so the coach came up came about it so they're supposed to carry so the word coaching is then identified as a process to transport people from the, where they are to where they want to be all right so so that's the word coaching so it's identifies a process used to transport someone from where they are to where they want to be so keep this in mind we'll come back to this at the end of the session so uh, as we are in the history of coaching, uh, that's where coaching came from, the Oxford University, one of the earliest models is the GROW model. How many of you have heard of the GROW model or read about it? Give me a thumbs up. You can give me a thumbs up, you can sh show me a sign if you have heard of the GROW model. Right, so I think the GROW model, it's uh, in the corporate world uh, where I'm a corporate trainer. Uh, a lot of my clients ask me about the GROW model. It is a fundamental model. Uh, uh, it's a basic model. I think it it serves as a foundation with which many other models develop from, right? So, uh, one of the uh, grow is one of the earliest, widest um, used models in coaching, and um, this idea was developed in the early 1980s, and it was formalized by Sir John Whitmore in his book called Coaching for Performance. I think uh, I think his first publication was in 1992, um, and so when he published this book, Coaching for Performance. Um, the coaching industry picked up from then and it was mainly performance focused so the grow model is about if you're not performing at work how do we coach for performance and and since we are still in history let me take you back to how i stumbled upon meta coaching and how i felt meta coaching is an evolution from this grow model so rather so i'm not saying that's good or bad right so performance focus is one thing but but there's a deeper meaning to performance, right? So what drives the person to want to perform, uh, that's where we go into the meta levels of things. So my background is, uh, so I purposely chose this picture because um, it is uh, one of the only dancing pictures that I have. So I come from a computer science background. Uh, so I am a computer science nerd. I used to like to, oh, hang on. Uh, excuse me, Roy. Uh, sorry, I, I'm seeing your desktop here. So uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, we don't okay. see your slides yet. Yeah, no slides. Oh, okay. So you guys missed this? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we missed this. <laughs> okay. 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 So, so no wonder I see how come my screen not green color on the sides. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So then I, I took you back to the future. Okay. <laughs> so this was a slide I was saying that most of you guys would have seen it. So uh, this is the GROW model. So the GROW model talks about four things, goal, reality, will, and options. So, uh, so meta coaching and coaching develop, uh, uh, evolved from the fundamental model of uh, GROW model. So, uh, so since while we are still back to the future, let's go back to the future uh, to where I uh, originated from. So I'm a computer science geek. Uh, I'm a programmer by study. Uh, and uh, over the years, uh, I skipped from job to job, uh, and my last job was a sales manager, so I was selling software solutions. So I lost my job when my two bosses had a big argument, so they didn't have a good conversation. They weren't dancing very well, uh, so they broke up. Uh, the company closed down and I lost my job. So as I lost my job, I started my first IT firm in 2007, but I wasn't very successful at that time, mainly because I wasn't very good with financial management. So I could earn money, but I could not keep money. 
earn 10,000, spend 20,000. Earn 20,000, spend 30,000. So at the end of my first business, I, was, I used to have eight credit cards. And eight credit cards maxed out. So uh, well, the National Bank of Malaysia didn't used to have enforcement, right? So you could apply as many credit cards as you could. I used to have eight credit cards. I used to have four personal loans. All these 12 holes maxed out. So I was at the brink of bankruptcy. Um, and, uh, and then I came across the mentor and the mentor uh, told me, Roy, I think you're still young. I think you better make a change right now. If you don't change right now, you'll be too late. You cannot U-turn. So I decided to uh, turn things around. Uh, and then I went into uh, training. Uh, so I started my journey as a professional uh, corporate trainer. Um, so I've been training close to about 2009, 13, 12, 14 years maybe. And so during the my journey as a corporate trainer, so I was a soft skills trainer, right? So I used to do team building. So my first, I used to do a lot of team building. Then I slowly moved into supervisory, moved into leadership. And then I found that, you know, I heard about coaching. What is this coaching all about? And I felt that a lot of companies in, well, where am I from? Malaysia required coaching. This is, was back in 2011. So I discovered that, you know what? I think coaching is a very important tool. So I got a couple of certifications um, uh, from different bodies and I started to learn about coaching. I started to practice about coaching. But over the years, I, I practiced about two, maybe three years. Then I realized that the coaching conversations I had wasn't deep enough. I was still very coaching to performance. So the person is not performing, I'm teaching, I'm helping the person to perform better, but they're not sustaining in their performance. And uh, well, if you believe in fate, uh, there was a gentleman that I bumped into when I was having a training in Penang in Malaysia. So I completed that, that, that training early uh, and I wanted to get a flight home uh, back to KL. I wanted to come home early to rest. So I went to the airport to buy an earlier ticket. And with this gentleman in the black coat uh, holding a briefcase in front of me uh, and he also was looking for a ticket to come home so looking at this guy i like to chat people up right so i was uh, saying oh this guy is a uh, you know he looks like a smart guy with a coat and a black suit so i walk up to him and say hey oh you're getting a ticket flight home yeah where are you going i'm going to kl yeah, i'm going to kl so oh, okay so what do you do i'm a trainer uh, then i said oh okay interesting uh, so we started talking and the gentleman uh, then we, I, uh, during the conversation that I had with him, I realized that he was also from neurosemantics NLP. So I did my NLP in 2009. That he was also a neurosemantics trainer. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, I just, oh what do you do? Uh, I specialize in leadership. I specialize in coaching. Oh, you do coaching. Have you heard of meta coaching? I said, no. It's from neurosemantics. Really? And, and the guy uh, that I met in that black suit is none other than Anthony Pinto, the guy in this room. <laughs> Small, small world. So then I said, hey, you know what? Neurosemantics has meta coaching. I said, wow, okay. So, and then I decided to now uh, find a new direction in coaching. I said, you know what? I needed depth in my conversation because the conversations that I had was not deep enough. And, and you know, deep conversations are conversations that create change. But I didn't have enough tools to help others in that change. So I started my journey of uh, meta coaching. Uh, so that I could become the emperor of uh, learning how to help others uh, coach other people. And so I went into meta coaching. I got my AC, uh, by the way, ACMC, I did my ACMC in 2015. Um, um, I became a SIS team in 2015 in Bali and the Philippines. Um, and so now, uh, I think throughout that journey, I have uh, become more well equipped in using the techniques of meta coaching to not only help others change their performance but rather change insight because uh, what meta coaching helps is they have this term called inside out for for things to change outside we need to change inside and so that's me here today i am a corporate trainer i am a leadership coach uh, and a meta coach and one of the things that i like to bring to organizations is this idea of happiness at the workplace because a lot of people I see in the workplace don't seem happy and I just always ask the question why why aren't people happy at the workplace right so they they should be waking up in the morning they should be excited they should be curious they should be adventurous and you know going to work with a different um, attitude and and so I stumbled across across this idea of omoyari when I was serving as 
uh, a president for JCI. If you have heard of Junior Chamber Internationals, it is a youth non-profit organization. Uh, so they had this idea of Omoyari, of how can we instill the spirit of compassion and mutual understanding in organizations. And so I think this is one of the most important values of humanity that we need to bring back to the workplace. Because a lot of people find that the workplace is a hostile space. So the moment they get there, they are very secretive, they are very protective, they are very close, they are very defensive, and they're just going to do what they are, they are asked to do, rather than do what they can and have the ability to do. And so, coming to today uh, and today's topic, the idea of coaching, I think most meta coaches that I've met, uh, the majority of them in a room, um, I ask the question of why do you want to coach? And a lot of them tell me the same thing. Uh, I think, Roy, coaching to me is a bigger purpose. It's what helps me or drives me to want to help other people to self-actualize. Because I believe that everyone has the power within themselves to find the resources, to find any solutions to any challenges that they face. And so I believe coaching is about facilitating change. And so if you are not a coach yet, uh, even if you're a parent, it's about facilitating that change. And so the score dance is one of the techniques that we can use, a framework rather, that we can use as a tool to facilitate this change. So remember, we are facilitating change. We are not telling people to change. Uh, because one of the things about the Chinese culture is, uh, especially in our families and among our relatives, we like to tell people what to do. <laughs> uh, but if you, can, if, if you are a person who is uh, pretty easy going, you can hear, come in left ear, go out right ear. Right? So, but the Chinese culture is, the more I love you, the more I'm going to scold you. The more I love you, the more I'm going to tell you what you are supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. Uh, and so it's, it's more or less of an imposing uh, ability. And so I'm going to use the score model or the score dance model as a container to the various models that meta coaching uh, has. So if you are not a meta coach yet, uh, I implore you to explore about what meta coaching is. Meta coaching has uh, seven, eight models, and so uh, including NLP, which uh, comes into the tool set of a meta coach. So uh, I'm going to use the score dance as a blanket that can help us take a bigger picture of how we can use the smaller, smaller models of meta coaching um, in our coaching conversations. Okay, are we okay so far? Good. Okay, if you have any questions, please let me know. If I'm going too fast, let me know. If I'm, 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 if I'm losing you, let me know. So, the first model I want to share with you is if you have not heard of this model, it's called the axis of change. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. And, and so this is called the axis of change. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be writing on the screen once in a while. So please forgive me if my handwriting is really, really bad. Uh, so I'm better at typing than writing, okay? So, so uh, one of the main models is, is called the axis of change. And so this is the first model. I'm not going to go in depth, by the way. So uh, maybe in other Meta Cafe sessions, we're going to go in depth into the, the models. But I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about the, an introduction of this model. So basically, an axis of change is there are four main lines with which we can... Um, base our conversations on, right? So the four axes that we talk about is creation, motivation, solidification or integration, and decision, right? And so there are, there's always a continuum between these axes. So what we believe in meta coaching, there is no good or bad meta programs, right? So it's rather a balance between uh, moving between the continuum of those meta programs. So, so when we begin to dance with our coaches, we swing between end to end, right? We swing between end to end. And so the direction of the conversation can take in a way, are we having a creation conversation? Are we having a motivation conversation? Are we having an integration conversation? Or are we, are we having a decision conversation? Now, from this model, what we want to really see is 
how can we from the angle of coaching use the the axis of change to help someone achieve realization right because again the ultimate purpose of coach is facilitating change but we cannot force the change upon others we we need to help the person realize what they need to change right and that realization has to come from the way that we ask questions the way that we build a rapport the way that we converse and um, um, in, uh, um, interact with them but if you know one of the things that a lot of us are are uncomfortable of is change so let me ask everyone in this room what do you think holds us back from change you can go to the chat room and let me know what do you think holds us back or what the obstacle that causes us not wanting to change comfort zone right fear of unknown not enough desires inconvenience right limiting beliefs so i've been doing the same things over and over again i feel comfortable why do i need to do something which is of inconvenient why do i need to do something which is not not normal to me or i feel awkward about doing which leads us to fear so the biggest obstacle of us wanting to change is fear and there are many versions of fear right there are fear of the unknown fear of uncertainty fear of failure fear of judgment fear of discrimination that's fear of pain and so fear is the main reason why we do things in our comfort zone why we stay in our comfort zone so let me ask everyone what is the the thing that you are most fearful of what do you fear the most failure hurting others fear of rejection what if it doesn't work right Wow, Anthony, even better. Fear of not changing. What if I'm not changing? <laughs> Fear of not changing. So this word is a very interesting word, right? And so let me do a quick experiment around the room. If I were to ask you to jump out of an aeroplane right now, how many of you would jump? I can see a show of hands. If you would jump, give me an eight in the chat room. If I would ask you to jump out of an aeroplane right now, how many of you would jump? Give me an eight. <laughs> how many of you would not jump? If you would not jump, give me a zero. Give me a zero if you would not jump. Zero. Ah, good question. So at least Mazuki, uh, clarification question. If the plane is on the tarmac, I may jump. <laughs> zero, zero, okay. And so my next question is, why are you afraid of jumping? What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Why aren't you jumping? Uncertainties, okay. Don't trust the source. <laughs> What's the outcome, the ultimate outcome that you're afraid of? Die, right, exactly. <laughs> so we are, so we are not going to jump because we are afraid of dying right but like what mazuki says i didn't say that the plane is in the air right but the first thing that comes to mind is hey you know what if i'm jump i'm going to die and so the definition of fear is false evidence appearing real and there is a quote that says man does not fear the action itself but man fears that the result of the action is not what they expect and so most of us are you afraid of the action of jumping or are you afraid of dying after you jump dying right so the act of jumping is not a problem doing it is not taking the first step is not a problem taking the action doing it is, is not a problem 
And but the result is right. So the more uncertain the result, the less courage we have. So meta coaching and the score dance is a tool that we help our coaches get more clear, to gain more clarity. The more clarity we have, the less fearful we become. Right? The moment that we are unclear, the moment we see blur, uncertainty, a lot of questions, we become fearful. And, and hence, I'm not going to do anything until someone has done it and they say, hey, you know what, that person has done it, I'm going to do it. And so in order for us to get clear, we need to ask more questions, and which is, it's a plane in the air. But be, due to our past experiences, <laughs> the moment we hear a plane, the assumption is the plane is in the air. And so if you ask me to jump, is there a parachute, Roy? Uh, is there, a, is, is, am I going to land safe? <laughs> uh, what, would you, what would you give me if I jump? What, would you give me a million bucks? And so now we hold ourselves back from taking that action itself. So what do you think causes this fear? So for us to, so we learn how to manage that fear first, right? So in order for us to manage the fear, we need to know the cause of that fear. So what do you think causes the fear? What causes that fear? Bad experience, right? Okay, let me do another experiment with everyone in this room. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you a few pictures. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to tell me what objects you see in those pictures. Okay, let's go to the first picture. In the first picture is, I want you to find me the hidden tiger. So very funny because Tony also mentioned the word tiger today. So uh, can anyone tell me where is the hidden tiger? Can you find me the hidden tiger? I think you can annotate if, if you know how to. Wow, I mean, very good. Uh. Too fast, are you? <laughs> so Dr. Amin says it's written on the skin. Everyone can see the stripes. So the stripes has the word, the hidden tiger. <laughs> wow, Dr. Amin, sharp eye are you? Uh. Uh, but a majority of us, what were we looking for? Were you looking for the picture of a tiger, Tony? Looking for the hidden tiger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, looking... The tiger is right in front of me. <laughs> a tiger hiding in the background. Yeah, some will say, Roy, maybe is it in the bushes on the right? Is it at the top? Is it behind the tiger? Is it in the? Is the tiger pregnant? Right. Okay, next picture. What do you see? Right, a man's face. So we have two pictures. If you if you zoom in into detail, you will see a face of a man. And if you look at the uh, if you zoom in, sorry, you see a lady walking on a field. There's a tree, there are some buildings at the back, and there's some trees. Uh, if you look at the bigger picture, if you look out, you will see a face of a man. Does anyone not see the face of a man? Okay, everyone sees the face of a man. Yeah? So I'm just going to sketch it so that everyone can see it. So this is the face of a man. Okay, so that's the forehead. And then we go down to the chin, side of the face, and we have the two eyes the nose and the mouth. Okay, the next picture is an interesting picture. What do you see? Old man, okay. Man holding a bowl. Uh, Dr. Amin again, uh, eagle eyes. <laughs> ladies, he says he sees ladies. 
Anyone sees the three naked ladies? <laughs> three naked Now I see. Right, now you see. <laughs> Okay, so our first, uh, most likely our first impression of this is we see Albert Einstein holding a bowl, broken mirror and a nail. If you zoom in, you will see the three ladies seem to be beside a waterfall or beside a pond. Last picture. What do you see? Couple by the sea, okay. A baby. Couple. Baby, all right. Okay, everyone sees the baby? Okay, all right, great. So maybe the first one you'll see the couple, and then after that, if you look at the bigger picture, you see the silhouette, you see the outline of the baby. Yeah, you see the outline of the baby. Okay, so my question is, from this few pictures that you have seen, what are some of the changes that you think that you are able to observe? What changed uh, in yourself, in maybe others? Any changes that you are able to observe? Perception change, right, great. Changes in perspective from bigger picture to details. Point of view, right, Rani? Yeah, changes of point of view. But what caused us to change our perception? So, for example, maybe the first one, the hidden tiger, right? Most of us were looking for the image of a tiger. What changed your perception? Very simple answer to it. When we get edition, and when Dr. Amin said, hey, you know what? It's on the skin of the tiger. So now, what has Dr. Amin become? An inspiration? <laughs> now, Dr. Amin has become an influence. <laughs> so his influence has caused us to change perception and perception has caused us to behave in a different way, right? So influence changes perception, perception determines behavior. So for example, Anthony was just looking at just now the Albert Einstein, right? So, okay, just Albert Einstein. Then Dr. Amin said, hey, you know what? Three ladies. Then, then Anthony's like, hey, wait, hang on. Where is this three ladies? I'm going to change my behavior so that I'm able to find that three ladies. And so what would happen to our behavior if influence is negative, if influence is bad, if we have bad influence, if we have negative influence, what would happen to... Sorry, I'm just doing this. Alamak. Yeah, so what would happen to our perception if Influence is bad. So what if we get negative influence? What would happen to our perception? Negative, negative perception. perception. Right, and negative perception leads to? Negative behavior. Right, so the cause of fear is negative influence. When we have negative influence, it causes us to perceive things in a negative manner rather being an opt well that's optimistic and pessimistic view of things rather than seeing things more optimistically rather than seeing the opportunities rather than seeing the good side of things many a times the that bad influence will cause us to perceive things more negatively so we're looking at res bad results rather than good results right so for example if i were to ask you to jump out for an airplane but based on influence, I don't know, on the news we read, uh, the videos we watch, if you jump from an airplane, most likely you'll die, right? But why would we not think that what if I would jump and I would land in paradise? I would find a bag of gold at the end uh, of that jump. I would land and see, you know, all my friends and family in a big house. And so the human mind and the human psychology is a powerful tool. 
which then will now lead me to the second model which I want to introduce to you, which is the matrix model. Right, so if you are a meta coach, you've heard of the matrix model, yeah. And if you have not, if you're not a meta coach yet, then it's about time for you for you to come on board, right? So, uh, and so the idea of the matrix model is from the movie, right? The matrix model, where uh, where the humans are now uh, being taken over by AI and they are now enslaving the human beings, and so the matrix model in the meta coaching perspective is about our past experiences, right? So our past experiences that has been categorized into seven different categories. So I'm not going to go into detail again, um, but basically we have seven different categories of the matrix, right? So we have our beliefs, our intention, we have um, our self matrix, our power matrix, our other matrix, time matrix, and world matrix. So our past experiences causes us to see things in a certain way and when we see things in a certain way we will act in a certain way and so if you understand the matrix model the human psychology is whenever we see something an event that happens outside the event itself has no meaning because the human being is a meaning making machine so based on our past experiences based on our matrix we will perceive things in a different way that causes us to feel in a certain way. And when we feel in a certain way, we will act in a certain way. And so this is one of the key distinctions in meta coaching, because when we come to the score dance, we will understand how this model makes sense. Because when we coach, we are not we are not getting people to come into our matrix, rather we are coaching them to their matrix. We are helping other people understand the way they manage their past experiences so that they can manage their fear. Does it make sense? So change, because change has to happen inside before it manifests outside. And so the word Meta in meta coaching has been used for many, many years, right? Since Michael Hall came about many, many years. But recently, Facebook has changed their name to Meta. Why do you think Facebook changed their name to Meta? What are they intending to do? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to achieve? They are more than everybody else. <laughs> So meta means uh, inner, right? Deeper, deeper level. So, so now the, 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 uh, I think the, the trend that the buzzword that's going around is the metaverse. So everyone's talking about metaverse, metaverse. We're going to Bitcoin, we're going to cryptocurrency, we're going to uh, TikTok, we are going into NFTs. So all these are metaverse. So what, why is Facebook changing into meta? It is because ultimately they want to create a world within a world. So the metaverse is a virtual world, right? A world within a world. And so if you notice, we have virtual reality, we have augmented reality, and we have AI. And so ultimately, if you notice, people like to, the younger generation, like to go into the metaverse because they can be more than what they feel they can be in the real world. So the metaverse is a space where you can fulfill your so-called potential without having fear. So it means in the metaverse, I can take on different personalities. I can have more courage to step up to do presentations, to speak to people, to interact, to connect, to do things which I may be afraid to do in the real world. And so in meta coaching, we talk about coaching to meta levels, which means you and I, we live in our own world. Right? And so we need to coach to your meta levels so that you can access deeper levels of your thought, deeper levels of your perception, so that we can find the small switch. And all we got to do is turn that switch and everything will come into place. And so all, you and I, all of us, have meta emotions. Uh, we have meta states. We have meta programs, uh, which are feelings within feelings, thinking within thinkings, which I think I will not cover in this session, okay? 
Uh, so yeah, so much more to share. So, so if you understand meta levels, the meta coaching system, unlike shallower models like the grow model, which is performance based, and performance based coaching rarely succeeds in creating sustainable change. But if we are able to coach to meta levels, you are creating inner, more sustainable change, which is more lasting change. And so that's why I felt that when I came across meta coaching, these tools were the tools that could really get, help me get my coaches get into the heart of things. So two models I've shared with you. Number one, the axis of change. This is model number one. Model number two, the matrix model. Any questions so far? So, the next question we ask is, how do we use the matrix model to facilitate change via the axis of change? <laughs> it is a conversation with which we use deep questions. And the third model I want to share with you is the well-formed outcome model, right? So our well-formed outcome model. So if you, uh, so anyway, for those of you who can remember, then uh, we will just do, it's a refresher, right? So for those of you who don't know what WFO is, a well-formed outcome question is an 18-question model with which it helps us structure the way we ask our coachy questions. Um, and so again, I will not dwell into this well-formed outcome questions. Um, but it's a sort of, I draw it in a funnel because we start with uh, general questions, bigger picture questions, and as we drill down, we get into questions which create more meaning for the coachee. And so when we use the well-formed outcome questions, we are trying to ask meta questions, which get into deeper levels of our perception, thoughts, and our experiences. So these well-formed outcome questions will enable our coaches to reach meta levels so that they do deep thinking. And so this is very important because uh, the general population do not have time to think deeply, right? So, so we need to help them take a break and, and really ask themselves meaningful questions and meaningful questions which will lead to meaningful change which will lead to meaningful actions and so that is how we facilitate change so as a summary i've shared with you three core models the axis of change i've shared with you the matrix model and i've shared with you the well-formed outcome questions now how do we use these three models in a dance, which is our main topic of today. So again, remember a conversation is a dance. So here is the score model from my interpretation of how can we combine these three models in a dance. So we just draw two pictures. And what coaching is, coaching is about bringing a person from a present state to a desired state. Remember the definition of coaching we started in the beginning? It's a process of facilitating, of bringing someone where they are to where they want to go. Right? So that's the purpose of coaching. And so when we understand that, uh, we use the three models in order for us to move them from the present state to desired state. And we need to do that by accessing meta levels and as we do that we bring them through a journey so the score dance is a framework that consists of five elements so the first element is called symptoms so when we begin to explore with our coaches, we explore what are the signs that are showing you that they are not happy with their present state, that they want to create the change, right? What signs are causing you that you feel you require to change? You are procrastinating, you are not motivated, 
you are not taking the action that you're supposed to take and you are you know you could be better than you think you are and so the second element of the score dance is called causes so when we explore the landscape of symptoms we move into causes when we ask questions of what's causing you not to change so what's causing you to have these symptoms what are some of the root cause that's influencing you and holding you back O stands for outcome, which is our desired state, right? So, so you are not happy with where you are right now. Where do you see yourself? Or what do you want to be? What do you hear, see, and feel when you get where you want to go? So that's the outcome that you want. And so we want to be outcome focused. And so in order for us to get from our present state to our desired state, we need to gather the right resources. So the next element in the score dance is about resources. What internal and external resources do you need that will take you from your present state to your desired state? So the, the, the journey of gathering these resources it's what we call action plan, right? So, okay, I, 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 so for example, if let's say your present state is you don't think that you're healthy. Okay, that's a good example, right? So that's a common example. So Roy, um, um, what makes you think that your present state is, is um, unresourceful? It's not helpful to you. Uh, you know, if I walk up a couple of flights of stairs, I'm, I'm, I'm already tired. Uh, I don't, I'm always, always very lethargic. I cannot focus properly. I cannot pay attention for long periods of time. I think I need to exercise more. I need to get healthier. So what's the outcome that you want? I want to lose weight. I want to stay fit and healthy. So what are the resources do you need to be able to get that? Or maybe you need to learn something, you need to find more time, you need to find more money to get a personal trainer, um, uh, you need to prioritize your work differently. So what are the internal and re external resources that you need that will get you to your desired outcome? And so the last factor, the last element of the score dance, uh, which is E, is effects. So this is score, S-C-O-R-E. And so effects is a way that we explore the motivation factor of that person. Is the person more motivated by the outcome or is the person more motivated to move away from the pain that's causing them? Now, if you notice, the conversations that we have in this landscape is integrated, to bring all things together, is integrated with our axis of change. So if you notice, when we begin the, the conversation of exploring causes, this is a decision in the axis. The conversation of resources is a creation conversation. The conversation of the outcome is an integration conversation. And the exploration of the effects is a motivation conversation. So if you bring all of this together, the dance is a dance with which we help others, we facilitate the change in others through the axis of change by accessing meta levels using well-formed outcome questions. And so my interpretation of the score model is bringing all the sub-models together, all the meta models together, I mean the deeper level models together. So the score dance helps us structure our dance. So when you dance, like we have our two dance instructors in the room, you need to have certain structure. You cannot say, okay, we're gonna go in free flow, right? We cannot say, okay, Mazuki, I'm gonna dance with you, let's go free flow. And so I'll probably step on Mazuki's feet a couple of hundred times, he'll probably punch me a couple of times. So we need to have certain structure with which we can use different moves. So the score dance is like if you're teaching, I don't know, Rani, what's an example of a line dance? Tango, is tango a line dance? 
tang tango is, it, is that right tango uh line dance is when you standing in line and then okay. you dance together so it's not a couple dance but you can dance with a lot of people making line for lines okay okay so that's a good example okay yeah. so so line dancing is a big group but then everyone knows what to do right yeah everyone knows what to dance and how to dance the music everyone knows everyone okay knows so the step. Okay, so there's, there are steps in it. Okay, so line dancing, for example, the example that Rani has given, is line dancing is like score. Okay, yes, it's like score. Like pocho, pocho. Thank you. Sir. Ah, Thank you. Pocho, pocho. Exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. Masuki, now you said now. Nah, okay. Poncho, poncho. <laughs> okay, so line dancing, imagine line dancing is score. We have the music, which may be our axis of change. We have the steps that we need to take, which is our well-formed outcome questions. And then we have the back and forth, which is like our axis of change. We're going to swing between the continuums of the axis of change. So if you bring all these three together and combine them, it becomes line dancing, which is score dance. And so, uh, so I learned this from the assist team training uh, in 2015 with Michael as he brought all this together. Because when, if you go to Michael Hall's training, you find it very hard to understand where he's coming from because it's coming from a clinical psychology background. So you really got to pick your ears up. You really got to catch the words that he's using. And I, I'm a lazy person. So when he drew this picture, I said, okay, now it makes sense. How does all of these models come together in the score dance as a continuum? Okay. Uh, and so as, as a summary, uh, to bring all of this together, uh, I think what I'm trying to share with everyone is that in the process of facilitating change, there are many tools that a meta coach can use in a structured way with which we can converse back and forth, where we can explore back and forth. But most importantly, we want to help our coachee achieve realization on themselves by themselves. And so um, I think in future Meta Cafe sessions, we will have the opportunity to, uh, or maybe in uh, Mazuki's Thursday sessions, we can have, uh, you can have the opportunity to deep dive into what uh, the axis of change is about, what are the um, um, matrix models that we have, and what are kind of the meta questions that we can ask, and what is the exactly the 18 well form outcome questions. Okay, so this is the dance. So back and forth, back and forth. So when you are in a meta coaching conversation, remember it's asking, getting that information back from the coachee, digesting that information, using the tools, coming back with a different question. And so that's the dance that we have between you and your coachee. And, and I think we will also get to understand that the role of a coach is not to impose, suggest, advice. So I think that's one of the key things that I've learned as a meta coach um, is not to tell other people what to do. <laughs> so one of the biggest challenges that I've had is to hold back my opinions, ideas, and thoughts as a coach. Because what happens in my world uh, and what I can do in my world may not be the same for my coachee. Okay, so that's it uh, for my score dance. Uh, any questions so far? Thank you very much, Roy. Uh, I love that. And uh, yes, as Roy mentioned just now, any question. So uh, if you have any question, just unmute your mic and uh, ask Roy. Go ahead. Um, can I ask uh, a question, Roy? If you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Rani. Very interesting session and I love the explanation that is awesome and also so clear what I would like to ask is uh, the explanation that you uh, tell us about how people's perspective can change if you give influence right mm. according to the influence but uh, in my experience, there are positive and uh, negative influence, right? Mm. How come that most people is more listening of the uh, negative influence from other instead of the positive ones? I mean, let's say I have a friend 
and let's say uh, he or she is asking for a solution to a problem and mm. maybe I told him or her to change uh, her perspective mm. but then uh, I gave her advice and then but instead of listening to the advice she chooses to listen to the negative uh, negative influence uh, rather than the positive influence that I gave her how is that possible i mean is it that's how uh, the human brains work they more <laughs> listening to the negative influence <laughs> instead of the positive one uh how how uh, what do you think about that is it working that way or I'm sorry for the silly question. No, nah, it's good, great question. I think everyone has that, right? So because as you, if you are giving advice, you come from a, a good intention, right? You want the best for the person. You want the person to get the best results. But the human psychology is this. Fear is our defense mechanism. Fear is our handbrake. We cannot not have a handbrake. If anyone here in this room has no fear, that either their wires are short circuited or they are not, not they, are, they are just not of well sound mind. So we must have certain levels of fear because it is our handbrake. And the human defense system is it's easier to fall back on our handbrakes. So we rather come back to our fears that will hold us back because it's uncertain, right? Because the advice that we are giving him comes from your own matrix. You may have gone through that experience, you may have seen the results, it worked for you, but that person may, may not have seen it from your eyes. So from that person's perspective, oh, this is great advice, but I still, the result to me is still uncertain. If I were to do it, I'm not Rani. I, I can't, I don't have, you know, maybe if you're asking me to dance, you know, Rani is easy for you to say because you have, you have good uh, rhythm. I don't have rhythm at all. You ask me to do one, two, three, I move three, four, five. And so I'm not you. So, so if, if I don't feel that I have your power, I will fall back to my defense mechanism because it's easy for me to operate. And so what will happen is I will pull the handbrake and I'll say, you know what, I'm going to listen to the bad influence because why? It gives me a space to escape. That bad influence is, Roy, don't do it. You're going to fail. Okay, I'm just not going to do it because I'm going to fail. So I'd rather not look stupid. I'm not going to do something that I may fail. So our defense mechanism by default takes us back to that fear. I hope that answers your question, Rani. Yes, clearly yeah. understandable very, very much. Right. Thank you. Right. So, so if I were you, I would suggest rather than advising, uh, perhaps you can start asking questions in order for you to get what you want. What do you need to do? What resources that you do not have that's holding you back? Do you oh, not have time? Do you not have money? Do you not have the right connections? Do you not have the right skills? Do you not have the right knowledge? So what do you need to have that will give you more courage to take that action? Then then that the person will think more resourcefully. resourcefully. Oh, yes, yes. I got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the advice. That right. is very helping. I will try it. Cool. Very, Thank you, Rani. Very good idea. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I mean, yeah. Dr. Amin. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with us, and thanks for that. Uh, my experience with the corporate world, not, individual, not necessarily individual coaching, mm. what I have seen uh, when we did transformation, I came with, like, like you, I use the WFO to clarify or to have clarity mm. during coaching. But then I have two parts. One, I call it mind to muscle, mm. which basically the grow model, I believe, is enough. Mm. Grow model, mind to muscle. That means you just want to change or you want to get things done. Mm. That means you're coaching for performance. performance. Correct. The other one is changing lifestyle. For example, I go and see a doctor. The doctor said your blood pressure is high. Change your lifestyle. Mm. I didn't understand what it meant, but yeah, I do understand the words. So I came with uh, another framework. I call it mind to, to genes. G-E-N-E-S. Okay, mind to genes. Okay. Yeah, that is where I believe the meta coaching is okay, is good. That is where I believe the metric models is good. Mm. But you need uh, the science behind it. 
Correct. You need to support the science behind it. So I tend to use my type coaching. If, for example, the person want to change a lifestyle, mm. but if it is just a simple coaching, then I think the grow model, the coaching performance is sufficient. That's how I look at it. Mm, mm, mm. I think the application is, if how ready is the person to change how mature is the person to change so if the person is at the level that they want to change and they know what they got to do to change and they are dedicated to that change they are they have the desire to change then the grow model would be performance based right because internally they're already ready set but internally if they are not ready and they're just saying for the sake of saying oh you know what i know i should be eating healthier i know i should be exercising more i know i should be quitting smoking i know i should do this i know I, but i'm not doing it so, yeah. so the question is, what's holding me back? Yeah, like losing weight, definitely you need my type coaching. <laughs> lifestyle change. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I call it mind to the genes. Mm. You must be able to change the genes yeah, to change your lifestyle. Correct. Deeper levels of change, yeah. Very much deeper level. Correct. So the matrix model is good. The mm. matrix. But as I said, we need to support the science behind it. Yeah. So it's a good framework that you have shared with us. Mm. Uh, I think uh, Michael Hall has a couple of books on the matrix model. So uh, I think he backs it up with his clinical psychology practice on his study on the matrix model. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, in a nutshell, the matrix model provides us a framework with which we structure our archives of our experiences. So it means when we go through life, we don't deliberately, you know, okay, I'm going to remember this, I'm going to remember that, right? So as we are growing up, especially in childhood, if you're growing up, so imagine if, um, okay, let me give you a simple example. Let's say imagine if um, I, will, I want to cross the road, so I'm holding my mom's hand, I want to cross the road, then I see these Mercedes Benz huh, cross by, then I pull my mom, 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 when I grow up, I want to be rich and successful because I want to buy this Mercedes Benz. Very beautiful. Then imagine if my mom just gave me one tight slap and said, Roy, don't be silly. See all these rich men? Rich men are people that cheat other people. To be rich, you need to scam others. You need to be dishonest. So, unconsciously, I may put this in my... Uh, one of one of the one of the categories of the matrix model is the matrix of others, right? So imagine if I put this book. So imagine... Um, the matrix model has seven categories. So imagine if your mind has seven bookshelves. So as you go through life, you will add a book to that bookshelf. Okay. So this, and so if you have a, uh, if you know how to manage your bookshelf, you will structure it. You will alphabetically um, um, uh, arrange it and stuff like that. So imagine after that experience with my mom, I put a book in my bookshelf of the matrix of others that says, "Rich man equal." dishonest man and as i grow up my belief matrix so my belief bookshelf says roy you must be honest at all times you must be trustworthy you must be uh, loyal and so that's my belief bookshelf. my intention is to be so my intention bookshelf my intention matrix is to be successful to be rich but now when i take out this book from the matrix of others for me to be rich and successful, I need to cheat others, which goes against my belief system. So internally, I'm now at war because my books are not aligned. One book says, okay, my belief is to be honest. My second book says to be successful and rich. But my third book now says to be rich, I need to cheat others, which goes against my values. And so we ask the question, does this, is this book relevant to your context right now? Because the experience that we go through may not be the, the ultimate truth of everything. Right? One rich man that cheats doesn't mean all rich men cheats. <laughs> and so when we challenge that book and they say, okay, so there are no good or bad experiences. All we got to do is say, this book is not helpful to me right now. Let's archive that book. Let's put that book aside. Do you need to find a new book? What do you need to do to be rich and successful? So that you can put this book aside. How many rich friends do you have? I have 10. Out of 10 rich friends, how many of them are dishonest? None of them. 
Right, so that's, is this book relevant to you right now? It is not. So I'm going to put it aside. And so I think the matrix model is where we begin to challenge our past experiences, the books on our shelf, and say, is this book relevant to me right now? And to find new books and create new books. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, yeah, Dr. Amin, thanks for your sharing. Different, uh, different models for different applications. A lot of my clients in the corporate culture, uh, in the corporate industry, also like to use Grow because it's simple and easy. <laughs> yes. Because uh, I mean, the, the few kind of changes in organization. Mm. The biggest challenge that I have when they want a vision change, meaning mm. that there's something they want to be different in the future. And that journey is painful or just not possible because mm -hmm. they're not changing the lifestyle of quality. Yeah. But if it changes because of our side, like COVID this and that, that one they're good in reacting. They're good. Mm -hmm. The vision one is the most challenging I've seen. Yeah, especially when you reach a certain size, the larger the, the, the organization, the harder it is for them to change. I think culture, you know, the, the hardest to change is corporate culture. So because of that, we put a framework, we said uh, there are four workshops that you mm. need to go through. Mm. One is developing the future. Mm. You can use the score models and that desired, mm. desired state and current state. Mm. Then we said the organization must be ready. We have yeah. culture, process, and technology. Mm. Then the last two is very much on the minds, mm. on the mindset. One is we call it mind management, mm. and the last one is a thinking capability. Mm. The journey can be rough as well. Mm. Mm. So we put a four workshops model. We call it to have some organization. Nice, yeah. nice. I think the top management must buy in. Very important. Yeah. I always believe the leadership must buy in. And the focus is very much on individuals. Mm. Mm. The last, the last two. Yeah, much on individuals. Yeah. So uh, as, as we use this model, it can cascade down, right? So as you start off these initiatives to change or do character transformation, the top leaders must then take on the meta coaching role. It's no longer us coming in to help them, but they now got to do the score dance with their people and their people with their people and their people with their people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Mazuki, I'll pass the, the baton back to you. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention and your ears. Thank you, Roy. Uh, that was uh, insightful for me. Uh, and uh, looking at how you have uh, put the three models into that, uh, uh, that conversation, into that score dance, uh, that's very insightful. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, let's give Roy a big hand. And uh, since uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, you don't uh, have any more uh, questions, so my advice to you is to forever remain silent. No, just kidding. <laughs> if you have questions after this, uh, you can uh, contact Roy and ask him uh, for the question. Just to allow us to consolidate uh, whatever that we have learned from Roy, uh, I'd like to invite each and every one of you to think of one key takeaway from this uh, session. So what is your key takeaway from this session? Uh, in a short while, I'm going to, uh, for, for, the, for the purpose of brevity of time, uh, I'm going to again throw you into the uh, breakout room uh, so that you can share with someone uh, what is your one key takeaway. So I'll just uh, allow for uh, five minutes for you in the in the breakout room uh, uh, for you to do that. So ready or not, uh, I'm going to recreate the room uh, so that we have three people in the breakout room uh, and I'll see you in five minutes. So be sharing your one key takeaway from this session. So go ahead. I'm sorry, Mazuki. I really have to leave now. Okay. Uh, I've got yeah. 
I got to go visit my parents. Yeah. Thank you okay. for joining. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, Roy Guacheng. Hi, hi, hi. Wonderful presentation. Oh, oh Guacheng says she did APG first, then only meta NLP. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, Neurosemantics first. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Hi, Sean. Hi. So, I think there should be another group coming in in a short while. Uh, a lot of things to share in a group. Yep. Good, good. Hopefully it makes sense. Huh? Today I was trying to <laughs> find a way. How, how, can we, how can I explain it a little bit easier? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like it, the way that you, you brought in the three models and show how the three models work uh, mm. uh, in the score model. So mm. that was very useful uh, for mm. me. So mm. we've come to the end of the session, everyone. I would like to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it is your being here that made this, uh, uh, this session uh, successful. And I would like to, uh, again, uh, thank Roy uh, for uh, such a wonderful presentation. It was informative for me. Uh, and uh, there are things from inside there that I can make use uh, for myself. So I hope that it was the same for you. I hope you had fun and you had, uh, were able to connect with somebody today. Now, before we end, uh, just uh, an announcement about what we will be having uh, in the near future. That on the 11th of June, we'll be having the ISNS community meeting. So this uh, meeting will be uh, announced uh, in the uh, Neurons uh, e-group. So this is open to everyone. If you are subscribed to the Neurons e-group, uh, then you will receive uh, an invitation to the community meeting. At the same time, in Malaysia, we will also be making uh, an additional announcement uh, regarding this. So this will be on the 11th of June, and uh, the next. Uh, Meta uh, Cafe uh, will be on the 18th of June, uh, where uh, I'll be speaking on what is the psychology underpinning your leadership. So that will be on the 18th of June. So those are the two dates that I hope you'll keep in view uh, as we move uh, uh, into June. At the same time, as I mentioned, the sessions on Thursdays, uh, they will be continuing on the next uh, Thursday the topic, uh, the theme will be on parenting. So with that, I would like uh, again to thank all of you and uh, I appreciate all of you for being here. And uh, I, we look forward to meeting you again. Uh, we'll meet again, don't know when, don't know why. If you can find that song, go and listen to that song. So with that, <laughs> I'll say God bless and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Mazuki, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.